the high plains break up into washed-out and gullied hills. It is all bright whitish tan, not a blade of grass anywhere, just scattered weed stalks and rocks and sand. The black of the highway is a relief to look at, so I stare down at it and study how the blur whizzes by underfoot. Beside it, I see the left exhaust pipe has picked up a bluer color than it has ever had before. I spit on my glove tips, touch it, and can see the sizzle. Not good. It's important now to just live with this, and not fight it mentally. Mind control. I should talk now about Phaedrus's knife. It'll help understand some of the things we talked about. The application of this knife, the division of the world into parts, and the building of this structure is something everybody does. All the time we are aware of millions of things around us. These changing shapes, these burning hills, the sound of the engine, the feel of the throttle, each rock and weed and fence post and piece of debris beside the road. Aware of these things, but not really conscious of them, unless there is something unusual, or unless they reflect something we are predisposed to see. We could not possibly be conscious of these things and remember all of them, because our mind would be so full of useless details we would be unable to think. From all this awareness we must select, and what we select and call consciousness is never the same as the awareness, because the process of selection mutates it. We take a handful of sand from the endless landscape of awareness around us, and call that handful of sand the world. Once we have the handful of sand, the world of which we are conscious, a process of discrimination goes to work on it. This is the knife. We divide the sand into parts, this and that, here and there, black and white, now and then. The discrimination is the division of the conscious universe into parts. The handful of sand looks uniform at first, but the longer we look at it, the more diverse we find it to be. Each grain of sand is different. No two are alike. Some are similar in one way, some are similar in another way, and we can form the sand into separate piles on the basis of the similarity and dissimilarity. Shades of color in different piles, sizes in different piles, grain shapes in different piles, Subtypes of grain shapes in different piles, grades of opacity in different piles, and so on, and so on, and so on. You'd think the process of subdivision and classification would come to an end somewhere, but it doesn't. It just goes on and on. Classical understanding is concerned with the piles and the basis for sorting and interrelating them. Romantic understanding is directed toward the handful of sand before the sorting begins. Both are valid ways of looking at the world, although irreconcilable with each other. What has become an urgent necessity is a way of looking at the world that does violence to neither of these two kinds of understanding, and unites them into one. Such an understand- <coughs> Such an understanding- will not reject sand sorting or contemplation of unsorted sand for its own sake. Such an understanding will instead seek to direct attention to the endless landscape from which the sand is taken. That is what Phaedrus, the poor surgeon, was trying to do. To understand what he was trying to do, it's necessary to see that part of the landscape, inseparable from it, which must be understood, is a figure in the middle of it, sorting sand into piles. To see the landscape without seeing this figure is not to see the landscape at all. To reject that part of the Buddha that attends to the analysis of motorcycles is to miss the Buddha entirely. There is a perennial classical question that asks, which part of the motorcycle, which grain of sand in which pile, is the Buddha? Obviously, to ask that question is to look in the wrong direction, for the Buddha is everywhere. 
but just as obviously, to ask that question is to look in the right direction, for the Buddha is everywhere. About the Buddha that exists independently of any analytic thought, much has been said. Some would say too much, and would question any attempt to add to it. But about the Buddha that, ex that exists within analytic thought, and gives that analytic thought its direction, virtually nothing has been, th has been said. And there are historic reasons for this. But history keeps happening, and it seems no harm and maybe some positive good to add to our historical heritage with some talk in this area of discourse. When analytic thought, the knife, is applied to experience, something is always killed in the process. That is fairly well understood, at least in the art. Mark Twain's experience comes to mind, in which, after he had mastered the analytic knowledge needed to pilot the Mississippi River, he discovered the river had lost its beauty. Something is always killed. But what is less noticed in the arts, something is always created, too. And instead of just dwelling on what is killed, it's important also to see what's created, and to see the process as a kind of death-birth continuity that is neither good nor bad, but just is.